My name is Jamie, I work for TrueLine. Um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we refocused our, our infrastructure, how we refocused um, to look at it as a platform uh, away from what it was and also how we refocused our, our people structure, our teams to try to match up with that. Okay, first a little bit about TrueLine. Um, we sell train tickets. We also sell bus tickets and, and ferry tickets now, I think, as well. Um, we do a, a fair volume of, of ticket sales. Uh, we have a reasonable number of visits to our site. And we do a lot of journey planning, and that's, that's the key for our product. We really want to be a smart journey planner, um, something which will actually just help you on a daily basis to get where you need to go. Um, hopefully some of you do know uh, the company, hopefully some of those people use it and hopefully some of those people actually quite like it. Um, but let's, let's move on. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me as well. Um, I've been, it seems a bit scary to say, but I've been in, in technology now for over a decade. Um, I was a traditional sysadmin. Um, I moved to managed service provider where I was a data center engineer for a while, racking and stacking and all that good stuff. Um, then I moved to a software house where I was web operations. And my title today is platform reliability engineer. Now I'm not telling you this because I'm an egomaniac and I want you all to know lots about me. I'm telling you this because I think it's a, an interesting parallel to the rest of the, the, the story that I'm, I'm going to sort of share with you today. So, TrainLine had, some years back, a pretty decent um, data center set up. Um, I'm just sort of going to represent this in my little diagram here. On the bottom, we've got the, the physical servers, the hypervisors. Um, then on top of that, we've got the, the networks, virtual and, and physical. And then we've got our virtual servers. And then the top layer here is the product code. So just everything that incorporates the product um, itself. Uh, we've got supporting services, which is pretty much everything else. Uh, although I've got the databases listed separately. So supporting services is, you know, logging, monitoring, uh, stats, uh, authentic authentic authentication, um, all those other bits and pieces. So with that, we also had a fairly classical team ownership structure. Uh, we've got some teams which own things almost in isolation, like the, the network team. We've got teams which take quite a wide view um, across something like the, the server team guys. They've got a view on building all the servers to a certain level, after which other people will obviously put their, their apps and their, their uh, software on top. Um, the database guys, are, they're interested in the database, but they're also interested in the, the health of the operating system, the health of the servers. And then we have a, we had an application product support team. Now these guys had a really wide remit. Um, they had to have knowledge of and um, basically protect and look after um, the, the, the application servers. Um, they had to understand a bit about each of those and what their function was, how they worked, and also supporting services that they would use to, to basically do their jobs. So that leaves the, the dev teams who didn't really have ownership on any particular aspect of this structure. Um, pretty much it's all taken already by the teams that would have been in, in the ops department. So that meant that for them to achieve anything, for them to actually get anything done, they had to go to the owners of those different, those different parts of the system, those different uh, parts of the infrastructure, uh, make the request and, and get what they needed. So this is, uh, this is my diagram of that. I should have actually, the, the individual characters are meant to represent the individual teams. I should have given them a, a hat with a color to make that a bit clearer. But yeah, we've got the dev teams trying to, to get what they need from this. So what changed? Well, the first thing was that there's an opportunity occurred, um, an opportunity for change. This guy was sitting around one day and he thought to himself, whilst it's not Christmas time, 
I've got a lot of these servers that I'd like to make some money on. So AWS was born. So I mean, AWS, I'm sure everybody in the room knows this. Um, it's, it's you know, arguably the, the biggest, the best, um, certainly one of the, the earliest. And uh, that's where we are. Uh, we've we've uh, taken up the usage of a lot of their services today. So again, what changed? We went from data center to cloud. Um, why do we do this? Well, like most things in business, there's a financial incentive to make a change. We had a, there was a value proposition that we'd, we'd have financial benefit, we'd have more flexibility, we'd have more agility, we'd make things faster, we'd get new features out faster, we'd get more love from our customers and we'd make more money at the end of the day. So, I think I joined the company about a year and a half ago and it was probably at the end of the move from the data center to AWS. Um, there's a lot of people did a lot of hard work to, to get that done. Um, I think it took about a year in total. Um, and it was pretty much lift and shift. Um, it was live live system, so I mean, there's, there was a good bit of logistics involved, but we, had, we did lift and shift to the extent that this was a representation of our AWS setup. We no longer have the physical servers um, on the hypervisors. We've got a sort of AWS um, API representing that space now. And obviously, although it's, there's some analogies, it is giving access to uh, more things, more services higher up, um, higher up in the stack uh, as well. So the question is, how are the teams interacting with this, this new structure, this new cloud structure that we have? Well, pretty much the same way they interacted with the old structure, to be honest. Each team still maintaining that territory which they had before, those responsibilities which they had before. So that leaves the dev teams again on the outside, not being able to bring to fruition some of the proposed benefits that we were very much buying into. Now this is a bit of a generalization because to be fair, the AWS API was accessible to the dev teams. They were able to access um, things uh, more services that they hadn't services that they hadn't used before. Um, they were able to to do things that they hadn't done before, but it wasn't quite what we expected. So once you've made a big change like that, you do need to stop and ask yourself the question: Have you got the value that you expected? So our answer was no. So. Then what do we do? We, we really want to, we want to get to that place where we're maximizing the value that this change has brought. So what we did was we looked at the, we looked at the tooling, we looked at the way that the teams were, were trying to access this to see what the requirements were and how, how that could be matched with something which actually allowed them to do these things. Um, and this introduced our first new team uh, first team to take the, the platform banner in the team name. This is a platform development team. And they and their, uh, their architect, Chris Tur Turvel, came up with the, the, plat the environment manager, which is essentially a, it's a platform interface for all the services that we're using within AWS. It's interacting with the AWS API, but it's obviously giving um, access to these things higher up the, higher up the stack. So now we've got the dev teams who are able to use this, and they're now, they now have access, they now have a, a, a certain ownership and a certain ability that they didn't have before. Um, just as a sort of couple of quick examples, the, this, this interface is allowing them to define ASGs, the number of instances they want within that, the code that we have um, in our repos to go on that, any dependencies that will be necessary for that. It's allowing them to do blue-green deployments and rollbacks. Um, it's allowing them to do scheduled auto-scaling um, at any time of the day and things like that. So the dev teams have been enabled to sort of look after their infrastructure. They're able to, to do more with it and do it faster. 
There's also an interesting overlap because the, the, the folks who had responsibility, who had a sort of guardianship and, and, and really um, had to look after the, the health of the production code in some of those systems, they're now overlapping with the dev teams who are taking control of their own applications. So, um, again, the dev teams through the platform interface have got greater ownership and it's allowed them to do a bit more. Um, as a quick example um, of one of the things, their ability to own their own pipelines increases. We did have a situation, as I think I mentioned before, where the server team were building all the servers up to a certain extent and then dev teams were adding their code or people were adding their software on top of that. What we realized was part of, part of the uh, way we were doing this was we were using Puppet to do the, um, the, the builds above the operating system. We run both Linux and Windows. The Linux um, builds, um, they were fairly smooth with Puppet. We start with a pretty vanilla um, AMI and we, we basically do the rest with Puppet. On the Windows side, we were actually using pretty uh, big baked, pre-baked AMIs because we, we were having problems uh, using Puppet uh, on, on Windows. We wanted something ubiquitous and Puppet was a choice, but there was problems with the Windows side of the tooling. And part of that, uh, or that partly um, created motivation for, for changing that situation, uh, both within the ops teams and also within the dev teams. And when the, when the ability for the dev teams to actually do more if their pipelines came up, there was a question raised as to whether they could take complete control of that build. And so it was decided that for servers, which were very much their own, um, that they, didn't, they weren't sharing with any, anybody else, they could do that. So as an example, there was a server uh, for a particular um, application server that I had done some work for to define the, the, the Puppet uh, manifest for. And we literally stripped everything out from the Puppet description down to the IP tables. We just left the role defining IP tables so that server could get onto the network and, and access what it needed to access. And with that role, they could take that to Environment Manager, um, our, our platform interface, and use that in their definition for, for creating their cluster. And then they could use whatever script they wanted to actually get the libraries, the packages, and their own code on top of that. Now, we're trying to actually work in a slightly consultant fashion with that so that they don't veer too far away from sort of build practices and, and other such things. But they have that freedom to do that themselves. And the second thing is, um, the, again, the ability to, to assess and to rebuild and, and have total control has allowed the dev teams to go on call. Now, there were, I believe, um, some of them were on call already before this time, but this has allowed pretty much all of our, our dev teams to go on call for whatever they're responsible for. So this then has consequences um, elsewhere. Um, the application product support team I mentioned, these guys, um, they had an unenviable job in some ways. They were literally the people who had to sort of pick up all the problems, uh, night or day. They were the first part, part of call. And part of the consequence of that was that they sometimes didn't get a chance to solve the problems themselves. They had to pick up problems that they couldn't solve, they didn't own, and so it was a case of almost handing them off to someone else who could. But that is a bit frustrating in, in if you're not really getting to complete the task and, and take that satisfaction yourself. But with the change of scope, we actually refocused this team. We now have um, a, a, what we call a platform operations team. So this is the second team to take the, the platform banner in their name. And they are now more focused, they are more dedicated on a set of systems which they are able to fix from start to finish. Um, they're kind of, they, they know how to go in and put the fires out, they know how to do that stuff. We want to make sure that they have a, a better chance to, to actually achieve the, the full fix. And it gives, them, it gives the company a benefit in terms of the fact that if they're not focusing time on just receiving a call or receiving a problem and finding out who they can hand it off to, they're actually spending more time on availability and reliability of our systems. So again, with our new focus on platform, and with our 
desire to maximize the value of, uh, of our changes. We introduced another new team. <coughs> Platform improvement team, which is the team I work in. Um, the third team to take the, the platform banner, the second completely new team. Um, we have primary focus on system improvement and reliability. So whereas the platform operations guys are kind of the firefighters, they go in, they, they sort of bring the thing under control. Um, they know how to do that uh, very well. They've got that wide knowledge. We have a more narrow knowledge but we'll, we'll go deeper into problems. So if there's a repeating problem, if it's a big problem, we're the guys that go in with the clipboards and do the forensics. Um, we'll look to follow up on these things and in some way similar to, but we're not modeled on the Google SRE teams where we're looking at solutions which are as automated as possible, um, as statistically driven as possible. And we're looking to actually make the, the reliability of the systems higher. So we're interested in things like response times and we're interested in things like error rates that are sitting in the background, that background noise that we really want to reduce over time. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to throw in some realizations that um, have been made and some that I've had along the way. I quite like to ask myself simple questions sometimes, especially after I've gone through a stage of learning something. Uh, for, this, for this presentation, um, I just stopped and asked myself, well, what is, what is platform? And the most immediate thing that jumps to mind is platform as a service. And alongside platform as a service, we've got infrastructure as a service and software as a service. These three kind of go hand in hand. So just getting, Getting a definition of these um, was one of the things I did. Also for context, um, infrastructure as a service at the bottom, then we've got platform as a service after that. Um, and so it's sandwiched in between that and, and software as a service. So immediately platform uh, looks like it's, it is just that particular layer. But personally, I think that when you're looking at a system, you really, trying to encompass all the pieces. It is, it is your platform in a sense. And as such for us, the reality is that the platform is everything that we use within AWS and things outside of it. Now, admittedly, the outside things don't necessarily um, integrate as well or as easily within our, our single one-ish consumable interface, but that idea um, is becoming stronger. So a single pane is something which is often talked about. And in this case, um, the reasons are that we're, we're starting to use services which are much more disparate in, in where they live. We're trying to collect them together in some way that we can actually use them in a fairly consumable and easy way. So internal here is really stuff that um, is, for us it's in AWS, but it's our stuff, it's our internal. Um, external are things like New Relic um, and other such services which we might use. Um, again, multiple layers that we might use, but we want to front those with that, that platform interface, that one consumable um, place. And finally, I think in a competitive market, we've, there is an ever-changing list of services and probably a more and more specialized list. So whereas people have a desire to be able to jump from one cloud to another cloud, depending on what their setup is, it can be challenging. Whereas when we get more and more and more niche products, those small products are actually, in theory, they should be easier to swap out. So if we have our one pane and we've got something which is doing something quite specific, swapping it for an equivalent competitive thing, which is doing that same job, should be much easier. So that single pane um, starts to look more visible. Um, I've got a list of, of, of things here that I just put together because these are the sort of things that we're having conversations about using external services for, so monitoring alerts, stats, logs, identity. Um, you might want to do MAAE. Uh, this isn't a real thing. This is something that somebody mentioned to me the other day that made me laugh. This is basically when, 
when you don't have visibility on something that you really should have visibility on and you need to get there quickly. Um, so yeah, find something that can do the job and if you can, slot it into your single pane of glass so that you have, um, you have it represented and you have access to it or you have uh, a, a way to, to use it relatively easily. But single pane of glass is difficult. It's, it's something that I've heard um, quoted from time to time, particularly, uh, particularly sort of from management levels where we have people who have to look down at everything which is happening and they want an easy way to see all that is going on and, and know it all. Um, but it's difficult. Anytime I've really tried to think about finding a solution which would do something like that, any system of any decent size is, is too complex, it's too hard to do that with. So the question then becomes which parts go in and, and which don't. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really the point. It, this, is not a, this is not an easy win, this is really a case of asking you what you value and probably you know, concentrate on the stuff which is the highest value work with that for your single pane and, and don't be <coughs> trying to achieve more than that because that's where you know the costs and, and the actual I was going to say pain but the annoyance comes from so one of the the fundamental things I think has come out of this process is that changing infrastructure changing focus on the, the technology that you're using. It may well be the case that you only fully achieve the, the value if, if you make analogous changes um, with the tooling and with the people structure, with the teams. But these changes may be staggered because let's face it, I mean, it's very, very difficult to, to truly um, anticipate the consequences of any big change. So what may well happen is that if you're making an infrastructure change, I mean for a lot of companies who, who have that, that infrastructure, it tends to be big changes there which kick these things off. If you're making an infrastructure change, there may be a pause, a time to kind of realise what analogous changes you may need to make before you make the next change and again before you make uh, further changes up to the people structure. It may be that, you know, um, a very in, insightful organization may be able to do it all at once, but it tends to be that there are always consequences which aren't seen. So, um, more specifically, I think we've seen that our, this, this, this focus on platform, um, on, on a platform interface to, to allow us to, to interface with, with everything that we're, we're going to use and everything that we will use in the future should we change services. That focus has allowed the developers to have a lot better agility. Um, we have massively increased the amount of deployments that we do. Um, we have more visibility over the deployments in terms of you know, what went right, what went wrong. There's a lot of logging which comes out of our, of our platform interface environment manager. For ops, um, it's been interesting for me, as someone who's, who's been in that space for a while, it's really created a situation where we're driving now towards reliability. We're not worried so much um, about availability because, you know, let's hope it's all okay. But I mean, our, our website doesn't go down much. Our, our apps are, are pretty, pretty solid. So it's, we're now looking at reliability instead. We're looking at um, statistics. We're looking at response times and the number of errors that we're seeing across the different application, um, across the different services that we have internally across our platform as a whole. And with those kind of changes, um, we, we end up redrawing job titles. So like I said at the start, it's, it's a sort of succession of different things. The core has remained the same for me. The core of actually understanding how systems work, the consequences of, of um, you know, network outages are just different systems and the way they interact with each other under different circumstances. Being able to troubleshoot all of that, that's remained fairly core throughout all these different job titles. But the tasks that I've been asked to do 
and the, um, the environments, that's changed. So I'm just going to leave you with some links. Um, if you haven't used our app, give it a go. It might be useful. Um, I've got the Environment Manager link up there as well. If you want to see that, we've open sourced that. That's, that's, um, that's on GitHub. So if you are interested, you can check that out. And there's a couple of links from me there. That's a, that's a very quiet blog. I will return to it someday. <laughs> Thank you very much.